Amen. Good morning, everybody. I was going to introduce myself, but I don't need to now. That's a perfect introduction to who I am. Rich has uh, summed me up there. Um, I hope you're all uh, having a good Jubilee weekend. Give us a wave if you drove to church this morning. Now, be honest. Hands up. Who used Google Maps? You guys have been coming for ages. <laughs> right. I, I mean, we are quite dependent on Google Maps, so I'll forgive you guys. I recently attempted a long journey without using Google Maps. I was going to my friend's wedding, and it turns out not the um, best time to experiment with not using Google Maps. Um, it was all going so well for a while. I was on the main road, I was about half an hour away, and I knew I had to turn off the main road soon. And I got to a set of traffic lights, and the car in front of me turned left without indicating. It was a pet peeve of mine. I was, um, you know, I, I admit, I was silently judging the driving in my heart. Excuse me while I sailed on through the traffic lights, only to realize I was meant to turn left there too. Not to worry, I'll just turn around. I built in some contingency time. This is what you do when you go to important events. And then I saw the worst sign I've ever seen in my life. No U-turn for 17 miles. <laughs> I quickly did the maths. That's 34 miles. I'm not going to make it. Why didn't I just use Google Maps? Ah, it was horrible. Every mile going in the wrong direction, knowing I'd have to do it again the other way. Somehow, I managed to come off um, somewhere and managed to get back on the road going the other way. I may have broken the highway code in the process. But I got there just in time. Whew. And as much as I missed the good old days of an A to Z. Anyone else? I have to admit that when it comes to navigating a car journey, Google Maps just makes it so much easier. But when it comes to navigating life's journey, we have no Google Maps. It can be so hard. And we've all got decisions that we have to make in life, whether big or small. We've all got questions that we're facing. Should I apply for that job or not? Will I get it? What if I don't? Should I stay in Leeds? Should I live in Leeds? Where in Leeds? Should I send my child to this school or that school? Which church should I be a part of? <laughs> should I ask that person out on a date? Should I become a Christian? I wonder what question you are facing in your life this morning, or perhaps will be facing in the future. And it can be really scary making these decisions. You know, we can think, what if I miss the turning and there's no chance for a U-turn? We are in desperate need of God's guidance to help us. So this morning, we're going to be looking together at understanding more about God's guidance for us in our lives today. We are in a series um, studying the book of Exodus. We're covering the first half of the book this summer. I say summer, it doesn't feel like summer, but it is. Where's the weather, I know. Um, so that's about 500 verses in 10 weeks. Today we're looking at three. So you might think someone got their maths wrong somewhere, but I assure you these are three amazing verses. We are in Exodus 13, uh, and we're starting at verse 20 if you want to turn there, but the words will come up on the screen. Last week we uh, looked at the ten plagues of Egypt and how Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. We're actually skipping ahead in the story slightly um, today. So massive spoiler alert, Pharaoh ends up letting the Israelites go. Sorry. So if you've heard this story before, try and imagine that you have never heard it. But put yourselves in the Israelites' shoes. You have just upped and left everything in the middle of the night. You are finally free. And at first you are so ecstatic. But a while down the road, you find yourself in the middle of nowhere, completely without direction. You've, got, you've left everything behind you. You are in desperate need of some guidance. Where do we go next? Which way do we turn? Are we going to die out here? In this crucial moment in the story of the Israelites, let's look at what God chooses to do. So starting in verse 20, the words should come up on the screen. After leave, leaving Sukkoth, 
they camped to eat them on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now, don't miss how awesome this is. Up until now in the history of the world, God has revealed himself to chosen individuals like Noah or Abraham or Moses. But now in this huge moment, he reveals himself to all his people. You see, fire and cloud in the Bible is associated with God's presence. Just think back to Moses and the burning bush a few weeks ago, or Jesus and the transfiguration in the cloud on the mountain. This pillar was not just some natural phenomenon that God used to guide the Israelites. Verse 21 says, the Lord went ahead of them, Yahweh himself. The pillar was the visible manifestation of the God of the universe's personal presence with his people. Let that blow your mind. You know, God could have guided the Israelites any way he chose. He could have just let a few chosen special people see the pillar. Or he could have just shown up in the pillar when it was time to go a different way. You know, like a cosmic driving test. Continue straight unless otherwise directed. But no, God chooses to reveal himself as the God who is with all his people all the time. Day and night, day after day, night after night, for 40 years. Now, I know you probably think, man, life would be a lot easier if we had a pillar of fire and cloud guiding us through our life's journey, you know, showing us the answers to those questions. But the truth is, we have all we need to follow him. In fact, we've got it better than the Israelites did. You see, the Israelites got to see the place where God dwells. We actually get to be the place where God dwells by the person of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's as if the pillar of cloud and fire has come to live in us. Now let that blow your mind. If you're a Christian here today, no matter how distant you feel from God, know that he is with you right now. He promises never to leave you. No matter what decision you're trying to make or what questions you're facing, know that you are not alone in it. He will always be with you every step of the way. And if you're not a Christian here today, know that that is what is on offer to you. A God who loves you and he promises to always be with you. So in trying to understand more about God's guidance, first and foremost, we need to know that the way God chooses to guide us is through his constant personal presence with us. Now, as Rich said, my job is teaching uh, English to international students. Recently, we discussed um, our childhood answers to the classic question of what do you want to be when you grow up? Does anyone want to guess what my uh, childhood answer was? It's so predictable. Footballer. Yes, I heard many people say. And, you know, I lived the dream. I played for Mosaic FC. (laughs) Somewhere along the line, I must have decided that uh, teaching was better for me than professional football. But it's a fun thing to ask, isn't it, when you're a child? You know, we discuss that question a lot, and it's fun to think back on that. But as I got older, this question became scarier and scarier for me because I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. And I can remember getting to a point where I'd graduated from university, and I still had absolutely no idea. And during that time, oh, um, excuse me, six of my notes, I'm skipping ahead. I was asking God for his guidance. As we've discussed, there were no pillars of fire or cloud for me, no divine signs. I didn't even feel the Holy Spirit was prompting me in one direction or the other. I was just unemployed and directionless. And it was horrible, horrible place to be. Some of you may be there right now. Or it might not be a job for you. It might be something else, that you're, a question that you're facing, and you are in need of God's guidance. 
For me at that time, I can remember I came to church one week and the talk was called Finding God's Will for Your Life. And I thought, yes, hello. This is where I find out what I'm going to do with my life, finally. This is it. And the very wise person at the front talking said something that changed my thinking completely. He said, instead of asking, should I be a nurse or should I be a teacher? A better question to ask yourself is what kind of nurse or teacher do I want to be? And why is it a better question? Because it's what God is most interested in. You see, this metaphor of life as a journey is common throughout all cultures, or most cultures. I wonder if you could picture your life right now in your mind. Just imagine your life as a journey. Try and map it out in your head. Think back, look forward. You might want to close your eyes if it helps you. See, I imagine most of us in the room tend to think of life's journey in terms of education, career, relationships, maybe location where you live. Questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or where do you want to live? These questions belong to the modern Western individualistic mindset. So they're in danger when we read the Bible of reading it through that lens and looking for God's guidance, reading about this metaphor of life's journey, but misreading it because we're thinking with that modern mindset. But if you stop and think about it for a minute, like most people throughout history, in fact, even in the world today, there are many cultures where people would just follow in the footsteps of their parents before them for as long as they were fortunate enough to stay alive. They wouldn't have asked these questions. But what is still up for grabs for all these people is what type of person they're going to be. So when the Bible talks about this metaphor of life as a journey, which is throughout the Bible, it's actually referring to someone's moral action or the development of one's character. Because God is more interested in our hearts than our career path or our relationship status. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. You know, when I used to read this, I think at some subconscious level, I thought this means pray to God uh, about the question I'm facing and he will just make it easy for me and show me what the answer is. I used to think, pray about the job, that I'm, which job I should apply for, and he will lead me to the right one or the one that I want. I've learned to understand this, that this verse means surrender my life to him and he will mold my character towards godliness. God cares about our circumstances, for sure. I, am, I do believe that. But the journey of life that the Bible talks about and the journey of life that God wants to take us on is one of growing in Christ-likeness, ever-changing from glory to glory, molding our hearts to be more like God's. Now, God is more interested in what kind of nurse or teacher I'm going to be. So the second part of understanding God's guidance is to reframe how we think about life's journey to see it through God's lens rather than the world's. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, if we want to be guided by God, we need to allow God to reframe how we see life's journey. You know, to see it from his perspective. Now, you may be sat there thinking, all right, that's all well and good, but it doesn't actually help me answer the question of do I become a nurse or do I become a teacher? Because even if I'm seeing life through God's lens now and I'm thinking about oh, what kind of nurse or teacher I want to be, I still have to decide whether I submit an application for a PGCE or a nursing degree. 
or whether to accept that job offer or not, or where to live or who with. You know, it doesn't help me with not knowing what my future is going to look like or help me with my fears about what lies ahead. And this is really hard. But I guess this is where trust comes in. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I said that we were going to look at three amazing verses. You may think that amazing is a pretty generous description for verse 20. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped to Etham on the edge of the desert. Nice memory verse for you there. But let me tell you why this verse is amazing. I know you're wondering where I'm going with this. Because this is a really stupid way to go. Instead of going directly out of Egypt, the Israelites were actually going around in circles, trapping themselves between the Red Sea and the desert, almost begging Pharaoh to change his mind and come and destroy them. All because they were following where God was leading them. Now, they soon did find themselves trapped between the Red Sea and the pursuing army of Pharaoh. And the only way out was for God to do the impossible, to somehow make a way. That's the reason that God took them on this detour. Tune in next week to find out what happens. Theologian Philip Riken says this, From the standpoint of military strategy, the detour that God told the Israelites to take was sheer lunacy. The coastal highway was the obvious escape route. That would have been the shortest way, but it was not the best way because it was not God's way. God always knows which way is best. Now the Israelites, without the gift of hindsight, without knowing what was happening next, camping out in the wilderness, terrified for their lives, they must have questioned whether they were crazy to carry on following this pillar. Yet they continued to trust God, even though they didn't know where on earth he was leading them. And just like for the Israelites, for us today, being guided by God is not about knowing where you're going but about knowing who you're following there. It's about trusting that God's way is best. I wonder what it means for you to trust that God's way is best today. You know, if you're facing a decision at the moment, maybe it means making the choice that you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you to, even if it's really hard and it's not the choice that you want to make. Or if you feel like He's not leading you one way or the other. Maybe trusting God today means trusting that he's letting you make the decision for yourself and that he will be with you every step of the way and he will use it to grow your character. Or if you feel like you're on a, you wish you were on a different path in life or you're scared about what lies ahead, you know, maybe trusting God today just means being able to declare that he is good despite my circumstances. You know, still choosing to come to church on a Sunday, still choosing to pray to him, and still choosing to worship him, which we are going to get to do in a minute. So know that God is with you. Ask God to reframe how you see life's journey, to see it through his lens rather than the world. And as hard as it can be, trust that God's way is best. Now we could stop there. And we could go away from here with a new resolve to you know, trust that God's way is best and set reminders on our phones to tell us that the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. You know, try and see life's journey God's way rather than ours. But we won't always get this right. The reality is, just like the Israelites will do later in the wilderness, we will fail to follow God's guidance. We will have in the past, we will again. Sometimes we'll slip back into viewing life's journey in the world's way rather than through God's lens. You know, sometimes we will struggle to trust that God's way is best or perhaps doubt whether he is really with us. And you know, this is where we need to know God's grace in our lives. 
We need to know again the love of God poured out for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is where we need to lift our eyes off ourselves and onto him. We're going to finish by praying. If you want to stand with me together. And we'll get to um, worship through song in a minute. Yeah, you might want to close your eyes. You might want to put your hands out to receive from God just a physical sign of receiving from Him. You know, think about whatever question it is that you're facing or whatever God's put on your heart during this talk. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are with us, you are in us. Come and speak to us right now, Holy Spirit. Help us know that you're with us. Holy Spirit, reframe how we see our life's journey to see it from your perspective, God, rather than ours. Help us to trust that your way is best. And Jesus, we look to you. You're the one who never failed to follow the Father's guidance. You said you do only what you see the Father doing. And we look to you, Jesus. You're the one who trusted perfectly that God's way is best. You're the one who gave up your life for us on the cross, saying, not my will, but yours be done. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen.